Okay. Okay. So, uh, real quickly, announcements. Uh, the only uh, new announcement we have is the brief share starts uh, January 7th, Thursday is at 6 p.m. So that's the, uh, any other announcements that I'm missing? I know we had the Christmas program today. Uh, what else? That it? Okay. All right. So, again, we are starting the seals, uh, the second through third and the fourth seals. Uh, this is session 18, believe it or not, and we are still in... Uh, let me make sure this is <coughs> focused. How's that look? Good. Okay. Good. good. All right. Probably just my bad eyes. Okay, so good morning again. We are still in Revelation 6, and we are in the, uh, the second, third, and fourth seals. Next time we'll look at the fifth and sixth seals. Now, these are very, the fifth and sixth seals are very important seals. The second, third, and fourth seal judgments are a little ambiguous. I'll be very honest with you. As we go through this this morning, you're going to see that there's some wide variety of possibilities of what these are. The fifth seal and the sixth seal, we know what those are. And we'll see those. They're, they're pretty, it's pretty obvious what they are. The timing, not so obvious, but pretty obvious what they are. So the second seal. So, um, when he opened, who's he? Who's opening the seals here? Jesus is. Remember, he's the, the seal opener. Good morning. When he opened the second seal, I heard the living, the second living creature say, remember, how many living creatures were, we, were there? Four. Okay, what are they? Anybody remember? The eagle. The eagle, yeah, the eagle one. The lion. And man. man. Okay. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I forgot to pass that around if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The second living creature said, Come. And out came another horse. What was the color of the first horse? White. And who did that represent? Probably the Antichrist. We were pretty sure. We did that whole discussion in, in session 16. Uh, and, I'm sorry, session 17, where we. <laughs> looked at the differences between the white horse and the rider in Revelation 19, which we know for a fact is Jesus Christ. There's no guessing. That's just the way it is. And we compared and contrasted the two. And so um, in the very fact that Jesus is the one opening the seals. And how can he be riding the horse if he's opening the seal? So we assume that that other rider is the Antichrist, but it also could just be a generic Thing. Uh, and we'll see that as we get into these seals today. Uh, another horse came out bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. Now, this is uh, kind of interesting because it says the rider is permitted to take peace from the earth. And when you look at the earth right now, you could say that the earth is definitely not full of peace. And people are already killing each other with weapons of various kinds. So, what this tells me is it's going to get a lot worse. You, you've seen nothing like uh, yet. So, red is generally associated with terror and death. Whenever you see, uh, and we'll look at some scriptures, uh, that red is the general color that's, you know, we have the, the, the red dragon, the scarlet beast. The scarlet is a dark, deep red. Uh, that is the woman who, uh, the, the mystery Babylon, the whore of Babylon in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. She's riding on the back of this scarlet beast. And... We believe that that scarlet beast is that red dragon, uh, which is the Antichrist in his kingdom that we'll look at in Revelation 12 and 13. You know, there's two chapters devoted to that. And if you include chapters 17 and 18, there's really four chapters in, in Revelation devoted to the Antichrist. So the, the red dragon is associated with terror and death. Uh, but also... Um, 
kind of mimics what we see in Matthew 24, 6, and 7. And we're going to start sprinkling a little bit of Matthew now into this. Uh, I'd originally, when I planned this lesson, these lessons out six months ago, I'd planned to do one just on Matthew 24. But I kind of drew back and said, you know what, I'm going to sprinkle it through time uh, so that we won't all get through it and then forget about it. Uh, Matthew 24. 4, 6, and 7, he says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this <coughs> must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, earthquakes, in various places. Now, if you read the King James Version, it says in divers places. I always saw it when I was a kid that in divers places, that must mean under underwater earthquakes, right? Uh but it's just one of those language things. The King James language is, is old. It's kind of antiquated. And you sometimes have to have a dictionary to, to, to interpret it. And it means in various places. And, and the idea here is it's in places that you normally don't associate with earthquakes. Now, one of the things that I think of it is I think of like Oklahoma and Texas, which are experiencing a lot of little earthquakes. And some of it probably can be a result of fracking, okay? But some of it is not. There's just, there's been a lot of, I mean, you know, a lot. And you, to me, if an earthquake is a result of fracking and it's a 2.5, what do I care? Okay, it does no damage. It may alarm some people, but they get used to it. And I've actually been in an earthquake. It was, I was in Los Angeles in 95 and they had a minor earthquake. And i never forget, I was sitting on the bed of the hotel room looking at the very terrible channel selection I had back then. It was like five channels. And, and I'm just sitting there watching TV, and all of a sudden it started to do like this. And I was like, oh, this is weird. And it just stopped. I mean, it was, a, it was like a 3.8 or 4 or something like that. It was very minor. Nobody else in L.A. even knew it happened. But I'm sitting on my hotel bed thinking the world's about to come to an end. So when we think earthquakes in various places, it's, there's, there's earthquakes in places where you normally don't anticipate them, where you normally don't see them. And I think we're seeing that right now. But what I want to draw your attention to is in here. It says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. What is the difference? Somebody tell me the difference between these. It kind of seems like it's a double whammy, but there's actually a difference here. Anybody know what it is? You have to get into the Greek to know it. You have to have actually done <laughs> some study and go, what does that mean? I'm curious. Let me go look at my Greek concordance. Okay, so what's the difference between a nation and a kingdom in this verse? Can I take a guess? Just one of Stab it. Is, is kingdom kind of the idea that it's multiple nations together? Yes. Against, so it would be almost like... Uh, uh, somewhat. Okay, you're, you're kind of close. Anybody else want to guess before I, before I spill the beans? Does nations refer to Gentiles? Nope. The Greek word here for nations... Is ethnos. Okay? So the idea of a kingdom here is a kingdom. We could say the United States is a kingdom, but we are not one ethnic group. We're kind of a classic example. Uh, you've got the kingdom, of, the kingdom of Great Britain, but they are not one ethnic group. There are many in Great Britain, even though they're under the king, the queenship of Queen Elizabeth. Okay? The, 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 she's the queen regnant, the, the, the reigning uh, monarch. So the idea here is, is that ethnic groups will rise up against ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. In other words, it will be interdependent of the nation that they belong to. You may belong to the same nation. <coughs> Syria, anyone? Iraq? Sunni, uh, and, Shia. Sunni and Shia. You, you can go into to Bosnia, uh, Yugoslavia. They may have been part of the same country, but one ethnic group is rising against another ethnic group. And then kingdom against kingdom is the same as it's always been. You've got the kingdom of France versus the kingdom of Great Britain in a hundred years of war. So that's been going on. This is a relatively new occurrence, ethnic group against ethnic group. Because prior to this century, really, the, in the later part, latter part of the last century, kingdoms really governed strong their ethnic population. So there wasn't this uprising amongst <clears throat> ethnic groups. They, it was always smushed by a monarchy. So you didn't have this ethnic group that was part of the kingdom of whatever, and this ethnic group part of the same kingdom. You didn't have them fighting because you had a king <laughs> smushing that. Now we see it more and more. You, 
most of the things, the conflicts you see now on television, uh, turn on the news. The conflicts you see there are mostly ethnics against ethnics. Okay. We even see this now starting in our own country. Okay. We're losing our cohesion as a country. The threads that bind us together are starting to unravel. All right? So we'll leave it at that. So, this writer was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. Now, this is a certainly symbology. This is symbolic of the time of what's going on here. Uh, it, but it kind of reminded me of Ezekiel 38, verse 21. It says, I will summon a sword against God on all my mountains, declares the Lord God, and every man's sword will be against his brother. You're not going to have inner fighting here. Uh, and it's nothing that God hasn't done before. Look at some of the ways he helped Israel out, you know, in days past. The angel of death would move through the, the Philistine camp and all of a sudden everybody's picking up a sword and killing each other. Because remember, even though we have free will, we are also guided by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, Proverbs 21.1 says, the, the king, the king's heart, his will, is a flowing river and the Lord guides that river wherever he wants it to, grow, to go. So sometimes even if a king wouldn't be predisposed to doing a certain thing. He's going to do it because the hand of the Lord is guiding him. Now, it doesn't mean we're a bunch of robots. And there is this fine line between, you know, God's sovereignty and our free will. And that's caused a lot of conflicts in religion. But we need to, I think this is symbolically looking at a time of, of uh, great up, upheaval, uh, of war, and remember, it's following on this guy who's, who's bringing supposedly peace because he's on a white horse, and white horse riders represent peace. But what we're seeing is he won't bring it. He won't be able to. And we also remember, if we think back what we read in Daniel, it says, by peace, he will destroy many. Under the name of peace, the Antichrist is going to bring death and destruction to so many people. And this is one of the ways he does it, is by sword. Sword is an instrument of war. So wars and rumors of wars. And we have what, famines, we have earthquakes, we have judgments of God. And we're going to see that in the third seal. So in the third seal, he opened the third. I heard the third living creature say, hey, come. And, and he looked and, and I saw a black horse and this rider had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is also very symbolic. Uh, and we're going to look at it in detail here. So first of all, the black horse. Famine and global financial collapse. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, remember one of the premises of this class? And I told you guys the very first lesson back in July 19th was that prophecy is a puzzle. And prophecy is a journey. You do not get to the third seal all of a sudden. People, if, if the rapture has occurred, if the rapture of the church has occurred, or even if it hasn't, the people living on the earth are not going to wake up one morning and go, global famine and financial collapse. It doesn't, it's not going to occur that way. We are in, right now, part of that journey. And I discussed this, I think, I can't remember if I talked about it Sunday night or if I talked about it both, several weeks, a couple of months ago, actually. How many nations are in debt? Of the 192 nations, how many are in debt? All but three. All but three. Under 95, well, depending on who. I'm saying. It, depends. it really does depend on what list you look at because some people aren't recognized. So, uh, and the list that I'm looking at with the, the global financial is 193 because there's, uh, I can't remember the name of the two that are. We're free. No, you're not. Well, yes, we are. No, you're not. So, but anyway, there's three that do not have debt to someone. Only three. 
And those three are really insignificant. It's like the Maldives, uh, British Guiana, or you know, they're they're, they're like their uh, their contribution to the global economy is a is a drop in that coffee pot. I mean, it's insignificant. Uh, you've got nations like the United States, which has the most debt total, but per capita, you know who has the most debt per capita? Mm -hmm. Europe. Somebody in Europe. Greece. Greece. No. Germany. No, you will never guess it. Luxembourg. <laughs> they, where we have like a debt of what, sixty to a hundred thousand dollars per person in the United States, depending on what debt you look at as an unfunded liabilities and all that. They have a couple of million dollars. Yes, and they are way in debt. Yeah, and they're way in debt per capita. So, but we, the point is, we don't just get here. Okay, it's a journey. And part of war is going to cause famine. Now, this is not uncommon. Warfare has caused people to starve throughout time. Okay, because one of the one of the methods of warfare is you starve people out. Whether or not you siege their their castle and cause them to starve. The siege of Jerusalem, it's in the Bible. What what how bad did it get? Started eating their babies. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Uh, let's see, everyone in here a parent. Okay. How bad does it have to get for you to cook your two month old? That's bad. And it's happened over and over and over again in history. That's terrible. This rider had a pair of scales in his hand. Now, let's go back and look. Remember, this is one of the, this is a bunch of these verses go, and I'm only scratching the surface of the number of Old Testament verses that we could look at because we really don't have the time. We would be here for three years. Um, Lamentations 5.10. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. So this is Jeremiah speaking of the famine of a besieged Jerusalem. That it caused, you know, when you, when you don't eat properly, when you don't have proper nutrition, you, you're, you're, you have skin problems. You know, just minor things like in, the, in you know, sailing days in the, you know, a couple hundred years ago. What was the, what was the number one? Scurvy. Scurvy. You know, it was James Cook who actually figured out that, you know, if they eat this sort of stuff and don't eat this sort of stuff, scurvy kind of goes away. He, he ran the first expedition where they didn't have a scurvy loss. And because he, he was having them eat breadfruit and having them eat some things, you know, and not eating certain things that caused vitamin C. Of course, he didn't know it at the time, but not eating certain things that caused vitamin C to be depleted from your body. Because one of the things these guys used to do is take the pots and eat the scrapings. I mean, you know, uh, out of a out of a pot that got cooked, and, and that was that would deplete your vitamin C because of something with the charring and the way they cooked. I don't know. So, black is associated usually with famine. All right. A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, this is more symbolic. But what it tells you is where we're going to get to. And this is actually nowhere that hasn't been gone to before. Even in the last century, this happened in several countries it, where everything goes so expensive. Because, see, what the wheat, barley, uh, oil, and wine are, in, in 95 AD, these were the primary food sources. This is what you, the average person's diet had these four things in it. Wheat or barley and oil and wine. You know, we've had this discussion about the wine before. Why didn't they, why didn't they drink water? Well, it'd kill you. Okay? Uh, so they had a little alcohol in there to kill it. And they had the oil for cooking, but that's also your body needs fats. You know, this whole, this low-fat diet stuff, they're now finding out, duh, you know, that that's a bunch of hogwash. Bring on the fat. Bring on the fat, right. You know, put down the spaghetti. Yeah. So. Bacon, is, bacon is good again. Bacon is good. Butter's good. Eggs are good. Avocados are good. Isn't it amazing that everybody, people who think they know so much, 
And, 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 and they, they sit there and they shove it down your throat. And if you look at the food charts, they still are pushing some of that stuff. Yep. So they start to pull back. They are finally, but how long, how long did it take them? Even on the cholesterol levels and yeah. some of that, they're starting to pull back. Yeah. Right. It's now, the, now they understand that there's LDLs and HDLs. Yeah. It's not just cholesterol. Right. You know? Just because it's a little bit over 200, it's not uh, the worst thing in the world. Get out there and walk a little bit. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one of the things that people, you know, people used to, they used to walk everywhere. They used, you know. You think about it, our lifestyle has gotten a lot more sedentary than it used to be. In Bulgaria, when I just came back, mm -hmm. most of the people, uh, I saw very few that were overweight because everything's on the mountains, right? So they walk. Mm -hmm. And the, the main street, they don't even let cars now. They have to walk. Right? So, well, you know, losing weight is all about um, what I call draining the tub. You know, you're, you're, it takes 3,500 calories of, of, to burn. One pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So what you got to do is burn more than you bring in, and you got to drain the tub. You know, you got food coming in as a faucet, and you got to drain what's going out, and that's your exercise and stuff. And you want to have make sure that more calories are being burned than you're bringing in, and there you go. But these here, this is just a basic diet. There's no meats in here. There's no eggs. This is survival food. For this time, okay? Remember back in this time, meat was a luxury. That's the whole problem in 1 Corinthians. And uh, in, in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council is, what do we do about meat? Because see, in that day, meat was somewhat of a luxury item. It wasn't, you know, meat. I had to have a meat and I had to have a starch and I've got to have a vegetable of some kind. You know, no, you don't. I know, I don't. That was one of our first... Discussions when we were dating, I fixed her, fixed her my famous green enchiladas, and she's like, "Is this all we're having?" I'm like, "What? Well, you got every food group in here. You got some dairy, you got some meat, you got you know some some carbs in there. You got vegetables in the form of little green chilies. What do you? Well, in my family, I'm like, well, I didn't <laughs> you're, you're, so it you're becoming a lead, so you just." <laughs> So anyway, amen, brother. <laughs> so, but these are the four essential food groups. Now, if you wanted meat back then, it was kind of expensive unless you went and bought it from the temples. Because after they'd sacrificed their animals, they, they basically had a butcher shop out back. And you could get it for like 30% uh, of the going rate. So, good stuff, right? So, but these are the four essentials. Now, so what, was, what was the value of these areas? What are they saying? Did okay, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about right here. It's one day's food ration for a day's wage. Think of how much you earn in a day, and that would pay for you only. You only. Not your family. You. If you took every cent that you made, a denarius was about a day's wage. And so what they're saying is ec economic collapse is going to be so bad, everything's going to be so expensive that if, if I make... If I make $200 a day, it's going to cost $200 for me to eat one meal or to have enough for myself for one day. I, I can't buy anything else. I don't have any food for my family. So basically, if I've got a family of five, I'm now down to fifth rations, quarter rations. You work five days just to feed the family one meal? Yes. Okay. And, and here, here's the interesting thing. Uh, this is where the Bible we know is inspired, and we're going to look at some other reasons here too. But no, so does, does everybody get to work then? I mean, does... Well, we're going to talk about that, but that, but probably not. That's part part of financial collapse is <coughs> people lose their jobs. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, the interesting thing here is wheat is three times more nutritious than barley. That's the reason why a day's wage buys a, a quart of wheat or three quarts of barley. Because, see, wheat is, if you take a, a, a quart of barley and a quart of wheat, you're going to get more nutrition from that quart of wheat than you will that barley. You'd have to eat three quarts of barley to get the same amount of nutrition. So, the Bible, see, the Bible understood nutrition. Even though the people of the day didn't, they just knew that they didn't feel as good after they ate, you know, a quart of barley. So, they, need, you know, needed some supplement. Uh, oil and wine. Now, there's a couple of things that this could be. It's, we know that oil and wine are luxuries, 
But we're either looking here at price controls. There's, there's two possible scenarios here. It says, do not touch the oil and the wine. In other words, don't harm it, the price of it. It stays, the same. leave it alone. So here's the, the two alternative, ex, the two explanations, and I don't know which one is true. And frankly, I don't think we'll be here for this, so, okay. It's one of two things. Either, first of all, there's price controls for certain things where the, the white rider on the white horse is going to say, you can't touch this. Or, more likely, it's that, you know what, the rich are still going to be rich and they're still going to be able to buy their oil and their wine. That's the one I think it is because if you look at every kind of financial collapse, rich people still eat good. All right? The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the financial collapse, the rich stay about the same. They may get poorer too, but they still got enough to buy oil and wine. See, I took that a different way. The, How'd you take it? All, the, in that area, is the uh, olive tree is their tree. Uh, that's what it is precious to them. Mm -hmm. So if you think of an olive tree, don't cut it down and burn it to a fire. You got to keep it. Don't touch yeah, it. Yeah, it could be that because that's what brings the olive oil. It could be. Yeah. And the wine the same way. Don't burn all the grapes. The grape vines. Right. The only thing here that I, I look at that is the guy had a pair of scales. And so, and remember, scales are, if you look in the Proverbs, over and over and over again in the Proverbs, God talks about just scales, about having scales that are valid. In other words, if I put a pound on there, it better be a pound. And so when we're weighing out how much these things cost, okay, it has something to do with the cost of it or the ability to buy it. These, Because these, like I said, these are the four essential... If you were to go back 2,000 years in time, you would find these four things on the average person's house. You know, not the rich person's house, not the Roman villa, the average Joe, the average working person who, who made a day's wage. Now, granted, they were able to buy for their family and have some stuff left over, et cetera, et cetera. But what it's saying is it's going to get so bad. I have a sidebar. Just sure. Real quick. They announced yesterday or the day before that there's a new alliance forming between Israel and Russia. And you probably saw it because Russia is wanting to buy the products from Israel. Right. And they think that that'll be where the uh, all the good food comes from. Mm -hmm. So that's I don't know how that fits into. Problems. Because I think God God is going to bless Israel during this time. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at look at what Israel used to be before the Jews took over, yes. and look at what Gaza has become since the Jews left. Gaza was a thriving. A place of flowers and, and, and produce and basically when Hamas took over when Israel left they, they took all of that infrastructure and sold it to buy weapons and now it places just a disaster so you know it, it'll be it'll be interesting how it all plays out uh, let's get to the fourth seal real quick <clears throat> you open the fourth seal I heard a voice from the fourth beast say come and see I look behold a pale horse and his rider's name was Death, and hell followed with him, or Hades followed with him. Remember, we have three compartments of hell. Three, okay, Hades is the one where the lost souls are now. Lake of Fire is, is empty. Tartarus got fallen, has fallen angels in it. Uh, so Gehenna hell, what's going to happen eventually is those in Hades will be emptied into Gehenna hell at the Great White Throne Judgment. So they were given authority. Death and Hades were given authority over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. So, I want to just point out here that death claims the body and hell claims the soul. So this is obviously a judgment against the lost of the world. All right, Those who would not repent, those who refuse to embrace the love of God, the love of Christ, to accept Christ, this are the these are the people that these writers are after? Yes, sir. Hey, bro, there's we ask we say that, but then you know how some people believe in purgatory. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, but it's like, but but they believe in purgatory because of the heaven. You know, they're waiting to be. You know. Yeah, but the problem is that's not scriptural. And but but then, but there is in hell there is hell that that there's people that take the the, the soul is taken by hell, but then the body is claimed by death. But I mean, so there's, there's, you said there's three stages when it comes to the 
helper. Well, what it's just saying is, is that this writer who's going to kill with these four ways is basically going to kill these people and they're going to hell. He's claiming their body and their soul. Okay. Um, so hell claims his soul. Now let's look at this fourth seal a little bit better. Looking at Ezekiel 14.21. Thus says the Lord God, How much more when I send upon Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence. So here we have another, this is the same thing that, that God was sending as a judgment to Jerusalem. All right, so we see it, to cut off from it man and beast. In other words, to, to kill everything because you're being judged. So we have to remember the seals are judgments. And What do you think the wild beasts? I, we're just hold on. We're gonna get there. Trust me. Trust me. We, we've got. I've got that covered. So the pale horse. Chloros uh, is the uh, the word for pale. Here. And it, it's a green horse. It's a it's a sickly looking green horse. Now one of the possibilities that this could mean is 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 Islam is green. And so some people are starting to draw the connection. I'm not going to dwell too much on it. I just wanted to offer that. Did you say Islam is green? Yeah, Islam is represented by the color green. If you look at anything, if you look at the things that they wear on their foreheads and their, you know, and their flags, they're, they're green. And so uh, some people draw the connection. I'm not going to go there uh, dogmatically and say it is that this represents an Islamic judgment. I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to give you the opportunity to research it yourself. Um, Four methods of killing. So we have the sword. That's represented by the red horse. We have hunger. That's the black horse. The second, the third one is pestilence. That's death. From King James Version, you look in the KJV, it's death. Uh, and what this is, pestilence is, is death that cannot be attributed to these other two. In other words, they die, but we don't know why. They didn't die from starving to death. They didn't die in war. There's another reason why they're dead. We don't know. And that's basically what pestilence is. It's an unknown cause of death. And finally, the wild beasts of the earth. Uh, a couple of things here. Um, it's possible that basically nature's gone crazy. And that we could take this literal. Wild beasts of the earth are killing people. All of a sudden, grizzly bears are, are coming out of the mountains, walking into Denver, and eating people. And what about the apes? Apes, true. Billy goats. I mean, you know, you can be killed by a deer. There are a lot of bucks out there that I'm going to try to kill in the morning that, that if, they, if they went crazy could probably kill me if I didn't have, if I wasn't armed. I hear they're armed. I'm going to worry about squirrels. <laughs> you need to watch some videos about deer gone wild, basically. If you get some in a rut and they get violent and they come at you with those horns, it can kill you. Even a doe protects Even a doe, because she'll she'll rise up yes, she with those I know. those we, hook. We appreciate you protecting us from that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna attempt to do my part in the morning. But, so, but what are the what's the other alternative? Let's get back here. I, I do have something to talk to you guys about. What's the other alternative here, David? Animal diseases. Diseases. It's possible that the beasts are microscopic beasts. The most dangerous beast out there is bacteria. And viruses. Uh, of course, the Bible is dealing with the people who have no concept of that. We didn't have a concept of that up until a couple hundred years ago. But it's possible that the wild beasts are plague type things. And, the, you know, basically it's a quadruple whammy. We need to just remember that. Yeah, and also, one of the things that happens too is there's an animal that's wounded or sick, they're more likely to attack. Like becoming rabid. Yeah. You know, if you get a, an animal that's got rabies and they go insane. Uh, so it could be, it literally could be any one of those things. Uh, the bottom line is that nature goes crazy. It really does. It, it, everything becomes unhinged. Now, I want to look at this finally. Uh, authority was given over a quarter of the earth. Now, did y'all catch that? He was given authority to kill over a quarter of the earth. And not over, like I've got, I'm over this area, I'm going to kill a quarter of it. But I have a quarter of the earth given to me in which I can do some stuff. Doesn't mean everybody in there is going to die. But that's my area that 
that, okay, I have the authority to kill. So, there's a couple of possibilities, but I'm going to share something that's really interesting, I believe. I think, okay, because it's something that I, you might not even remember, I got real excited last year about this time when I saw this and I started doing crunching some numbers. So, uh, first of all, it could be that this is a quarter of the population, okay? So, of the 7 billion people or 8 billion people maybe by this time, the, the death has given authority over 2 billion of them. That's a possibility. It could be a quarter of a land mass. Of all the land mass that we have, maybe that this horse is given authority over a quarter of the earth, the land mass. Uh, does it mean a quarter die? In other words, of all the population, he's not just been given authority over a quarter of them, but he's been given authority to take a quarter of them. But I want to share a hypothesis with you. Um, to, and remember I said that uh, earlier, I said we talked, we we're going to look at something real interesting about the authority, what I believe is inspired, uh, shows the Bible to be inspired. And I, I really think that this is, this is true. Uh, land mass makes up a third of the earth's surface. We all know that, right? Okay. So you have land and you have water. The actual land makes up a little over a third of the earth. Well, here's the interesting thing. If you take away Antarctica, the land makes up a quarter of the earth. And it's almost down to the million square mile. If you look at the total land mass of the earth, and I can't remember how many, it's a hundred and something million square miles. If you take away Antarctica, and then you look at the total land mass of the earth, uh, total mass of uh, surface area of the earth, and then the total surface area of land minus Antarctica, it comes up to al almost exactly one quarter. So what I think the Bible here is saying, this is a guess, that verse 8 is saying that the entire inhabitable land mass of the earth, with the exception of Antarctica and the oceans, because we don't have really people living in the ocean, you know, not, you know, there are some people out there on boats and stuff, but, uh, and we, ha we have a few people living, that, but, but nobody lives permanently down in Antarctica. They either winter over some of them, or most of them go down there for four or five months. We've got a good friend of ours, I, Kathy Wyman, uh, who um, went down there on research. How many summers she go down there? Three? Three or four? At least two. Yeah, sure. yeah. So she was a meteorologist down there. Um, so what I think that verse 8 is talking about is that he gives authority over every inhabitable piece of land where people make their lives. So I have something close to that. If you think about the 43rd and the 33rd parallel is where most of the in the world lives. Right. If you take that band around the earth, that's about a quarter as well. Right. So yep. it's very similar. To that. Very similar. Yeah, and but like I say, what's really cool is when you take, when I actually got it in my other Bible, and I can show you guys where I made the notes, okay, it's 100 million square mile, 128 million, and Antarctica is 30 something million, you know, when you take it all out and do all the subtraction, it came out to like 23.5% or something, 24%, so it's almost exact. I, I just wonder though, why, why is it, why is it worded that way, is that, is that still the intent, because that word that authority is given to a portion implies that there's no authority over the rest of them. So why yeah, yeah. they just say the whole earth is that's where most of the people are. Because that's where the people are. And, I, and also you see, I think that there's not a judgment on the waters. Because see, that comes later. That comes in the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments where there's a there's judgment on the seats. This is judgment on the land. Yeah, because it's implying an exclusion too. Right, it's implying there's an there's exclusion. Judgment. And I think to answer your question, honestly, if this is what it is, like I said, I'm not dogmatic about it. It could certainly be any one of these others, okay? But I think that if this, if this is what it is, the reason why it is is because God is showing that I knew that through John, I revealed how much of the earth's surface is inhabitable. How much, because you can remember that, that in 95 AD, they had no idea that there was a Pacific Ocean and how big it was and, and how much water there was. They didn't know. I mean, if you'd ask somebody in 95 AD, how much land is there and how many oceans are? They might have said it's 90% land. They didn't have any, any idea, any concept of a globe and a quarter of it is land. I mean, I just find it a very cool coincidence if it is a coincidence. But there, I don't think God... And, and to be honest, you know what it could be, Mark? It really, the way God does things, it could be all of those things. Yeah. It really could. And I probably should have added that. The final possibility is it's all of the above. So, 
Javi, are you satisfied that you know as much as you can possibly know about the horses? Now I just have to worry about buying this. A what? Eskimo suit. Oh, you want to try, you think you're going to Antarctica, is that it? <laughs> but no, yes, I know more. I'm okay, so next week we're going to look at the uh, fifth seal, which is the judgment upon the saints, the believers. That's where we get our martyrs. And we'll also look at the sixth seal, which is a great earthquake. And I've got an interesting theory about that great earthquake.